There is one reason specifically. Nigga, you like the waifus. And, well, the story as well. But I feel like he should cover that too. So, how gacha games keep you playing? This is going to be interesting. Let's figure it out. There's probably going to be a lot he's going to talk about. And I'll make my points. You get the gist. Let's not simply play gacha games. Gacha games play you. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about the predatory practices of these games. Limited time events or characters, fear of missing out, obscure pricing, and so on. But how true is that? Well, today, allow me, a psych major, to chime in, which is, by the way, one of the most useless degrees in college ever. Damn! At least I get to make this video. I'm going to show you all the psychological tactics I can think of in which gacha games employ to retain and keep you playing. At this point, I've reviewed several gacha games, and I've even started out this channel going over one in particular. Hopefully, at the end of this video, you will understand the many- I'm doing fine at Grand Assault. ...game practices, and know how to take precautions to not get yourself trapped in the hands of these developers. My name is Psyche. Let's get started. The play- I can say for one thing is the playable waifus. I would say FOMO, but like, it, all, it depends person on person if you really care about the FOMO. And if the dev team and if the game actually has a good way of archiving certain things, like for instance, making story some events permanent, so and replayable, and that's one thing. Fear of missing out on some characters, but that could be fixed if they care if if they go into like a whole standardized um summoning pool, like for instance, Nikkei's wishing list, stuff like that, you know, or like BA when some characters just get thrown into are just in the standard pool and there's some limited characters. You get that? But for me, it's just whatever. I just want to say fuck guys. Is he that bad like later on like in the harder modes? Because I feel like that's the case. But he is pretty tricky though. First, uh, let's establish some expectations. By its core, gacha games and by extension live service games have two primary goals in mind. To have players play the game for as long as possible and spend as much money as possible. Exactly. Egg fucking exactly. That's why whales exist. And that's why casuals exist. I'm going to say this right now. Yes, companies can be generous. They can be generous. They can give out rewards and stuff. But there's you have to be a time where they can't be too fucking generous. Remember that whole stupid ass drama when it came to this crown skin of Modernia skin and Nikkei? And people were like, why can't we just get this shit for free? Or why is it overpriced? Well, uh, I'm sorry, but they need money. <clears throat> I, I ain't gonna lie. It's a gacha game. They're, they're trying to make money. They knew, they, they know who's gonna spend. They know who's gonna spend on the, on those skins. I bought both. I literally bought both, so. They know exactly what they're gonna be going for. But this makes sense if you think about it. As part of the player base, you would want your game's popularity to grow. And want to keep the developers within good financial status so that they can continue to make meaningful updates to the game you enjoy. I am also one to believe that the monetization and retention techniques don't have to be abusively implemented. One expectation I do have, which I understand some people may have critiques about, is end game optimization. In a gacha game, this is handled by one of two ways. The first is by making end game upgrades very grindy, taking up resources that may take a while to obtain. This approach guarantees progression, albeit very slowly at a time. You know that farming every little bit of resources gets you closer to that final upgrade, and that is progression on your account. The light is at the end of the tunnel. You just have to get there. The second approach is by implementing an RNG gearing system. This will be your artifacts in Genshin. By making endgame progression chance-based, players won't know how close they are to their desired late-game build, since anything can happen with any given artifact. The advantage with this system is that you could get lucky and instantly be able to get a viable piece of gear on your first try. But the disadvantage, as you may have guessed, is that you could farm for weeks or even months and not get what you want. Mm-hmm. That is true. That is very true. Honkai Star Rail, Genshin Impact, Weathering Waves, all have artifacts, all have some kind of artifacting system. Weathering Waves when it comes to their echoes. Some echoes are hard as fuck to get. Bro, <laughs> they are hard as fuck to get, bro. Like, God, bro. 
holy shit bro grinding artifacts especially with the rng based system can be the most tedious shit shit ever it can be so fucking tedious and it's hard it's definitely hard to just stay with i can say with i can say with one thing with weathering waves even though it feels tedious at times i'm still able to get at least the one cost one cost or three cost echoes for me like i'm fine with it like i'm definitely fine with it like i just grinded i got the boot because right currently right now they're doing a tactics field double reward boost i did that shit twice and got the shit that i needed i got two one cost echoes with the attack main that i needed i got another three cost Spectro, by the way, they're all Spectro. I got a Spectro damage bonus being the Spectro element. So, you know, shit like that. I do like how it's very simple, but it can be, at times, very grindy. Like, very, very grindy at times. But when it comes to Genshin, oh my fucking god, bro. Woo! Yo, 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 yo. I just wish they had a way to optimize Genshin's fucking artifact system. It sucks so much dick. <sighs> And that too, at least they give you selectable um three costs as well. Making progression an all or nothing scenario. I do expect either of these systems to be in place for any given gacha game. The question is, how well is it implemented? I try these games because some of them are pretty fascinating. I think for whatever reason, gacha games are home to some of the best storytelling, the gameplay loops are simple and you know, I you know I'm I'm not even gonna lie with that one. He he ain't lying with the storytelling. <laughs> he 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 ain't lying when it comes to storytelling, and that's the thing that I was talking about with um with some of the gotcha games turning into single player games. Like I some I I don't want everything in one fell fucking swoop that I'm just gonna play for that moment and then I'm just gonna forget about it later on. Like I do like how gotcha games some of them do their storytelling. Being it simple and efficient later on. Blue Archive. Volume 1. It traps you. It gets you in hook. Fuck. It hooks you in with the most ridiculous shit like robbing a bank, my nigga. Like, what are we doing? We're here talking about schoolgirls robbing a motherfucking bank. It, it ain't getting no crazier than that. So it's like, hey, if this shit gets crazy, what's to say that it won't get crazier later on? Later on? And guess what? It does. It does. It fucking does. Arknights. Arknight storytelling. It's a whole ass Bible verse. But it does get good later on. It does get good fucking later on. It all depends on how good your game storytelling is and how devoted on some of the fans are. Because your storytelling could be either it's good at a certain it will get good at a certain point, which is majority. Uh, which is a whole majority of the gotcha games because like i said before beginning of gotcha games like chapter ones and most gotchas are not the best and they kind of start off a little bit slow and don't grab the people's attention like immediately it takes them a while until they get in or eh, is there really an or nah i don't think there's really an or I think that's it. I think I really said my piece Unlike right there. traditional live services, it's quite easy to jump into and play, considering most are mobile games and require relatively little maintenance. So for a bit of disclaimer, I tend to be a bit more skeptical when it comes to playing and reviewing gacha games. But that doesn't mean that gacha games can't be fun. In my early YouTube days, I played indie roguelikes, which was a far cry from the content I cover today. In case you're wondering why my gacha reviews always seem to be in the 7 or 8 out of 10 mark, this is because having gacha mechanics in a game, in my opinion, is already predatory in nature. No matter how good the story, sound design, or lore are, a gacha game cannot receive a 10 out of 10 rating. It just feels rather disgraceful to compare it to something like Elden Ring Elden or Ring. Baldur's Gate 3. Yeah, I would say keep it, I would definitely say keep it, uh, gacha games, like, keep it in their media saying like, oh, this gacha game is like, is better than this gotcha game or this gotcha game is way more is way more fun it's like you got you keep it in the gotcha realm trying to compare a gotcha game to like these other triple a's is pretty hard or like giving a rating to them is like pretty hard but it's very it's two different things it's totally fucking different things 
So I get what he means. Now don't get me wrong, I find gacha games to be fun and interesting. But the vast majority of the time, the maximum I will grade a gacha game will be an 8 out of 10. Which already means that I think it's very good. The reason I don't bring up these commonly used tactics in reviews is that we become desensitized to them since every gacha game is doing it. I know it's there, I know the nature of life service games must have some measures of player retention in place, and I know these games need consistent funding to continue its development. But I also believe that there are ways to monetize and retain players well, and ways that are not so well. I find myself... <laughs> wait, 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 wait. ...ways to monetize and retain players well, and ways that... Diablo Immortal. What the hell happened here? I gotta look this up. I have to look up why. What the hell happened to Diablo Immortal situation? Not so well. I find myself having more fun in these games if you know what they're trying to do. And now I'm going to explain exactly what those predatory systems are and how you can better take care of yourself as a player. Even if there's no clear solution to combating some of these practices, I think just knowing what they're doing can help you see things more clearly. I will say though, Gotcha Games are the best live service out there. Not even uh triple, not even triple A games can compete in that factor. Hey, hey, Adriano, fuck, hey, Adriano, play. Yeah, I can definitely say with most live service, with most live service A triple A's games nowadays, like you'll see them, they'll pop up, they'll be played for a little bit, and then they just. Go out of service. Like for instance, Square Enix's Foam Stars. I don't even know anybody remember knows that fucking game at all. When they announced pretty much Splatoon, it's pretty much just PlayStation's version of Splatoon. But way more grindy and a lot more just boring. It if it, it just looked boring to me. I was not gonna try it at all for myself. I watched a video on it on why it fail on why it's pretty much failing or failed. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was a lot, bro. There was a lot, but yeah, some live service games, but well, Magacha games just definitely know how to grab the people, grab the attention, keep them in, and stay for the long run. I one thing is for sure is story though. I think story is like a very important fucking thing. I say story story is one very 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 crucial thing in Gacha games. Because let's be real. People are here for Blue Archive. It's like Blue Archive and Nikkei, for example. And Brown does too. I'll say Brown does too. You see the out you will you will see like all the titties and ass. Wait, hold on, hold on. Let me let me let me throw let me throw that out the way. Hold on. You let me let me separate those two. Brown does two and DK. You'll see the titties and ass. But once you to bring you in, but once you get into the game itself and you read the story, and if you're interested in the story and you read about it, you're like, oh. There's more to this than just titties and ass. The story is actually quite interesting. Chapter one hooked me in. Like stuff like that. Blue Archive is like, oh, cute girls that was school. school fuck. Cute school girls with guns. This sounds goofy as hell. Let me try it out. If you're interested in the story, same way. You go in, you read the story, read volume one. You're like, what the fuck is happening? It seems pretty interesting. Let me just read about the rest. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, damn, there's politics. Oh my god, nigga, there's gods. My nigga, there's Jesus. There's rabbits. There's fucking rabbit platoon girls fighting fighting other schools. Fighting the police force. Like, there's a lot of random shit. As soon as you get in, you're hooked. I feel like that's really it. As soon as you get in, you're fucking hooked. Clearly. Let's start with how gacha games tend to time gate your progression. Have you ever wondered what kind of activity in the game gets you the most amount of XP or progression points while taking the least amount of time to do. Well, let's take Withering Way yeah, as waifu a recent elements. example. Following the footsteps of its popular predecessor, you'll notice that the two actions that will grant the most amount of XP on a routine basis are daily quests, which gives a whopping 2,000, and spending wave points, which is in the hundreds mark for each dungeon run. While story and side quests can grant you quite a big amount sometimes, they cannot be repeated. Now, you could explore the open world, solving puzzles and opening chests for meager amounts of XP like an absolute plebeian, or you can just spend around 10 minutes of your day doing dailies and spending your waveplates to get over easily 3,000 XP right then and there. Yep. Pretty sweet deal. 
This trend is not exclusive to Withering Waves, as a lot of other games I've played also do the same, where spending the time replenishable resource tends to grant the most XP. And what do you know? You can get more of these resources using real money. And that's how they get, and that's literally how they get you. I did this in Weathering Waves. You wonder, there's a reason why I'm, I'm able to like, I was able to grind up my teams pretty quickly. I used a little bit of my um, Asterite for farming because I just want to build my characters. I want to build my teams. These tactics of replenishing enemy, en enemies, energy works. This works, especially for grind hungry people like me because i'm a grinder i love grinding shit in games you want to know why i grind you want to know how bad it i do it for instance pokemon complete the pokedex i complete the pokedex and pokemon in x and y i completed both pokedexes is sun sun and moon and ultra sun and moon and here's the thing there are version exclusives as well so i literally had to get another friend and find other ways to fucking grab to fucking get those kind of other exclusive Pokemon. I completed the Pokedex of Scarlet and Violet for both for the first DLC and the second one, not the third one, not the third one because I was like, eh, whatever. I completed Pokemon Sword and Shield's Pokedex and its first DLC, and I believe I believe the second DLC as well. I gotta check though; it's been a hot minute. So yeah, I'm a grinder. I love grinding shit. It's just fun for me. Personally, it's not personally there for a lot of people but i love i love it because i love the thrill if you look up any guides on how to progress faster a pattern for most gacha games is to tell you to log in every day do your dailies spend your resin wait play ap whatever it is and repeat from a time efficiency standpoint this makes perfect sense but you can probably see the implications of having there are only two deal seasons yeah there is but there's three dexes i i think you forgot there's the main story the main story, Teal Mask, and then um, Blue Indigo, then Indigo Disc. They all have their same de um, extra dexes to them. And there's a completion to them. I know this. Because I fucking played both. And I mean play both, I mean played all three, so. Daily missions as your main source of progression. They're dailies. Meaning, it would require you to log in every day. Even if it's just for short bursts at a time. Add in some level requirements for quests and other types of character progression, and you have a system to encourage daily logins in order for meaningful progress to be made. This goes into habit formation, which is a point I'll bring up later. But for now, let's take a look at another retention technique. Live service games need a steady stream of new content to keep newer and existing players engaged. They can do this in one of two ways. The first is by actually making frequent and substantial content updates within a reasonable time frame. You can say whatever you want about Genshin, but their team has been stellar with content schedules and new events. You're constantly engaged with events or minigame modes, and the time to completion feels fair. Sorry, but I'm not engaged with that. Sorry. This is not for me. I I'm just, I think it's fine for the casuals, but this is just not for me. Fair and reasonable. The second option, on the other hand, is by simply increasing the grind or the amount of time needed to get to the late game or the completion state, such as what FGO has done over the past year or so, by introducing append and servant coin upgrades, as well as making events three weeks instead of two in order to artificially increase the grind without actually providing significant new content. It doesn't take a genius to figure out the latter is much easier to do. I mean... I mean, you're saying, quote-unquote, engaging content. Then why do you keep coming back and playing it if it's not that engaging? If the gameplay, if a gameplay is not engaging to me for a game, I'm not going to play it anymore. I'm going to drop it. So there is a reason why everybody comes back to their gacha games. There's a reason. <laughs> there, there, there's definitely a fucking reason you are engaged. You, you are engaged into the content. It may not be engaging to other people, but if you keep coming back and back and back and back and just almost every other day, you are, uh, you're engaged, bro. Than the former, the battle pass is also a popularized retention technique. But luckily in the gotchas I've seen, they typically don't take long to do, which should be the case anyway. I haven't finished I, I'm not even I I'm not even close with beating Weathering Waves' um Battle Pass. I'm only at like 40, bro. I'm only at 40 and I'm not even close. 
most not even fucking close. Naturally doing your events or dailies. Compared to some live service games out there, the time to completion is way shorter. Now, I generally don't have a problem with these types of progression. The short daily grind allows someone to realistically enjoy the game extremely casually on the side. This is a trend for the games I've reviewed, but for the main things I look for is how natural or how easy it is to progress. A common trend is by complicating progression by introducing a large and diluted pool of currencies and resources to keep- I already lost- I so left my Genshin chain, so after having those big ass breaks from it. List were only used when you perform certain actions. I'll show an example of this done pretty atrociously. I'm currently playing Honkai Impact the Third, and this game has some of the most convoluted currency systems I've seen in a gacha game. Different modes take different tickets to enter, shops have so many currencies that you don't know how much it actually costs, and hardly any of it is explained to newer players. Next up are monetization tactics. The most obvious one is the obfuscation of the cost per gacha summon. As you know, most polls in gacha games use their dedicated currency, but the amount used per poll- I could say for one thing, DK monetization, it's very... It's not worth it. <laughs> Some, sometimes it just feels like it's not fucking worth it. Sometimes- I, I just don't- I don't see it. Because I would have to go- I have to look back at their fucking monetization prices of just regular ass gems. Because if we had to really break it up, with them, it's 3k for a multi. And it's three, it is 3k for a fucking multi. Well, we gotta go back. Hold on. Let me pause the video real quick. Let me pause. So, real quick, we're doing a DK. So, we know that a multi summon in this game is 3k, right? If I go to, if I literally go to the recruitment, it is 3k for a multi. If you spend, even spending, let's see, 20 bucks, spending 20 bucks, not even close to a multi. You go to 50, I believe this is like, it's a multi, it's a multi, but it won't get, you, it's not two multis. And when we go to like $80, this is two multis. If I'm doing the math correctly in my head, this is legit two multis. Uh, 80 bucks is like two multis right there. Pretty, pretty wild. You put three, because 3K times two, 6,000. 6, and then for you have, if you have leftover gems, yeah. Is is not you can definitely tell like DK for example that's why spending in DK is like it's just like not it's not worth it it really isn't obviously spending in any gacha game isn't worth it but when DK if you really do the fucking math and seeing how ridiculous these how ridiculous these prices are from what you're actually getting you can definitely tell this is not worth it <laughs> clearly this is not worth it. Not at all. Because if multi summons are really going to cost you 3k. And it's still the thing. And here's the thing. They cost you 3k. You pay 80 bucks. Yeah, that 4% looks nice. But you need to have that 2%. You got to have that nice little 2% right there. So even if you pay for that. It's wraps. And that's when. They get to pat. They want you to buy these packs. This is why they want you to buy these little packs right here. Because even if you want, even then, even then, you buy these packs. Twenty bucks is one multi. Say you don't have pretty much no. Say if you don't have enough gems for a multi, you buy this, and you're not still not close to a multi. This is just one. But then you got your tickets, so you'll have two multis. This one right here. You got three multis. Three multis right here. And then the hundred dollars. Three multis. Right here. Three multis with the tickets. And this. Two multis. Yeah, two mul yeah, this is two multis. 
Because if this was 9,000, this would be three. This would be six multis in total. So even buying these packs, it's still, you're still not really getting it. And even then, you could be unlucky. Right there, that's where the luck factor comes in. Even when you buy all these packs, you need to have a big ass chance of luck to be able to get the character that you fucking want. And that's why I say with Nikkei's, um, with their stuff, nah, fam. That's, I was talking, I was, I had a conversation with Zeoxis about this too, when it came to the whole fun, with like spending on DK especially. I was like, yeah, this shit ain't worth the dog. <clears throat> this shit pretty crazy, bro. You get more value out of like other gotchas than this. Because even though, like, here's the thing even though Blue Archives, like, the most you'll pay for in Blue Archive especially with the packs is around 60 range i'll still get like a few more i'll still get a few multis in that game i'll still get a few multis in the game i'll be fine with it but the pity but that's when the pity rates and all that shit comes in and that's where it's like oh fuck this shit this shit kind of sucks but hey if one thing is gonna be good or decent Something else is gonna have to fucking suffer. <laughs> if Blue Archives fucking pricing and stuff was gonna be good, I right here let me refer, let me reverse that. If Blue Archives pull rates were gonna be any good, their pricing and monetization, it was gonna have to suffer a little bit. It's either one or the other. It's that's really how it is with these gotcha games, and you can see it. If one thing is really fucking good. The other is going to be potentially a little bit bad. It's but I would like to see what he number. says, though. There's Genshin's classic 160. I've seen 130, 180, 200, 280, 300, and so on. Of course, each step that the player will have to convert real money to gacha currency hides the actual amount of money spent. So you lose track of how much your shiny waifu or husbando actually cost. If the amount per summon was, for example, 100 gems, and then I ask you, quick, how many gems for 7 pulls? Oh, 700. Easy. But if it was 160 gems per pull, and I ask you the same, suddenly you have to do one more calculation. You gotta use your head a little bit. It doesn't help that the majority of gacha currency packs are listed in off amounts, not in even purchases that equate to a certain amount of pulls. So in the human cognitive processes, we use our brains in one of two ways. There's system one, which is the fast automatic process, and system two, which is the slower, more deliberate way of thinking. If I asked you, what's two plus two? Four. Well, unless your name is O'Brien, you would have thought of four immediately. You didn't <laughs> need to think about that. If I show you a box of donuts and I said, hey, pick one, you got five seconds to decide. Then you might pick your favorite one, such as the chocolate one, or the plain one, or the sprinkle one. You don't necessarily need a reason to pick a donut. When you do these actions, you're using the system one way of thinking. Automating these processes are helpful in everyday life. Of course, if we gave a thought to every single action we did, it would be very inefficient. On the other hand, certain decisions you- Yeah, I, I see where he's coming from. I do see where- he, I, I definitely see where he's coming from with that one. It's like, I can literally ask chat right now. Hey chat! Question. If you play Blue Archive, who's your favorite Blue Archive waifu? Go right now. Right now. Quick quickly. Who's the first student that who's your who's your favorite Blue Archive character that comes to mind? Go ahead, go. This shouldn't be even a thought. This shouldn't be like quick and analytic for y'all. This should be like immediately. Like this should be quick as fuck. Yup, there it is. Like see. Mika, Deru, Koharu. Like, it should be... This is the system one. I see where he's coming from with that. I had to make sure to use an example, so I'm like, boom. Let's get it. I see where he's coming from with the system one. ...you make in life, such as which college to go to, which job offer to accept, we would often have to sit down, weigh the pros and cons, and really think about it. This is system two at work. A general rule of thumb, we hate using system two because we actually have to use our heads. This is especially seen in present days, 
where social media sites like TikTok and Twitter promote a constant stream of stimulation to keep you hooked. Don't think, just consume. Mindless consumerism is a topic that would probably take way longer to dive into, and a topic that's not necessarily related to this video, nor do I have the knowledge to go over it. But this is a problem that's very prevalent in the present day. This is exactly something that Gacha Games' cousin, Casinos, try to exploit. By obfuscating the cost of the gambling currency, you lose track of how much you actually spent. And if you don't get what you want, especially if you're in the heat at the moment, you're not thinking, okay, so I need to spend this much money to guarantee the item I want. Instead, you're thinking, I, I want this, and I need to spend more money to get it. How much? I don't know, and I don't care. Yup, yup, oh my god, he is on the fucking market with this one, folks. Everyone fucking does this in the gotchas. They have, at one point in certain time, there is this one character in a game, in a gotcha, that I know that you wanted so fucking much that you, it didn't matter what you do. You could be grinding almost every fucking day to make, get enough gems and pulls for this one character. And it's worse if you got a fucking job because that means you have a, a way of income. And if you have a way of income, that's a fucking extra, that's a big ass trap right there too. Motherfuckers like me who got a job, uh, they, <laughs> it's a trap. Especially when you're here in the moment and you're fucking clicking that nice old temp, temp pull button. And you're like, bro, I'm almost there. I need this shit right now. Come on. It has to be there. I got to get this. I got to get it. I'm so fucking close. Because you know how I am when it comes to pulling on the on the gotchas, especially when I'm on HSR. You can tell, like, all right, and weather waves at HSR, all right, I'm, like, this close to pity. If I get to this point with pity, I have it. I'm right fucking there. Okay, soft pity. I'm almost there for soft pity. All right, all right, let's, let's get it. I just need to get to there, right there. I'm so fucking close. I can feel it. This is all understandable. This is all relatable. The best way I can mitigate this is by calculating roughly around how much gacha currency I need in order to guarantee the results you want. Yep. Remember, casinos and by extension gacha games don't want you to think. It is to their advantage for you to mindlessly consume and spend money until you get what you want. The one trump card you have as a gacha player is the pity system. This is, in my opinion, the main differentiator between classifying gacha games as gambling or not. You can't pity a jackpot on a slot machine. But you can guarantee your 2D waifu here. True. That is true. That is that is so true. So to say like, yeah, this is like this is like the semi version of gambling. I can understand it. This is pseudo gotcha games are pseudo gambling. But there is a catch. Because a pity because a pity system does exist for these games. These games carry pity systems. You have a way of still being able to get this character somehow. But when it comes to conceit, when it comes to conceit, casinos can't do can't do that shit, right? So when you ask a got so like if you ask a gotcha player, would you rather spend a hundred bucks in your favorite gotcha game, or spend a hundred bucks at the casino? Um, what, what do you think they're going to say? They're going to go for their damn gotcha game. Because they know, in the end, eventually, they're going to have, they're going to be able to pity their fucking character. If I go to a casino, drop a hundred, I'm losing that a hundred. I have no way of pitying my hundred dollars back. Or being like, oh, I spent my hundred, don't worry, I can pity you back thirty. I can pity you back 50 bucks back. You have a way of getting your money back. No, no, no. Casinos have no way of money back guarantee. There is no money back guarantee when it comes to casinos. And that's how they fucking trap you. You lose. You literally lose shit, bro. At casinos. Because casinos give you fucking nothing. You legit get fucking nothing when it comes to casinos. For example, in Genshin, I generally try to save enough to fully reach pity to guarantee one copy of my desired character. When I pulled for Chloride, I had around 27,000 primogems. 
if you do some rough calculations, a round of pity is around 80 pulls. Mm -hmm. So multiplied by the 160 primo gems per pull, that's around 12,800. God damn. But in case I lose the 50-50, times that by two, and I get around 25,000. In this- That's- oh my god, that's so, that's so much money! Fuck, bro! Oh, I love the fact that he's doing the math, because it, sh it generally shows you how bad this shit gets if you cannot control- if you don't have good control. And it shows you how fucking bullshit if you lose the damn bitty somehow. Like, god damn. But yeah, I do I do see your comment right, Ninja. You are correct. With your money, you will get something in the end with your money. And the thing is, you will keep it in your gacha game. Like, all the gacha games I have, I have Verena. Wait, no, that's, 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 no, 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 not, not Verena. I have Forina. Damn, why the fuck are they so close? I have um Farina. Damn, what the fuck? In Genshin. I have Verena. No, Farina. Zhang Li. Yelon. Raiden Shogun. Kakome. I got all these characters in the game. Right? I got all of them in my account. There is no way I'm going to be able to lose those characters unless I lose my account. And that's pretty much it. If I go back into the game... I'm still going to keep my characters. So my money technically wasn't wasted because I still have the characters that I bought. I still got the characters that I wanted. They're still there. Go to a casino. I lose my money. I'm not getting my money back. <laughs> it's simple as that. You don't get anything back. It's the same way when it comes to DK and all these other gotchas. So even if you pretty much take your breaks and quit them, it's like whatever. They're still there. Mm. What about you, Wes? Well, it was a fun ride. That's really all it is. It was a fun ride. But in the moment, but here's the thing when it comes to EOS. It's not like you're losing all your shit at that moment right now, like how casinos are. So picture this, right? I'm in a casino. I use, I pretty much put in the $100. All my money is gone at that moment. I lost all my money in an instant right there. I'm never going to get that money back. I won't see it. I'm not going to be able to see it. EOS, we don't even know when that shit's going to happen for most of these gotchas. We don't. We really don't. Arc Knights, for example. I don't know when, the, I don't think Arc Knights is going to be EOS in no time soon. I'm gonna be real. They literally dropped the fucking concept trailer and they got like content for the next two, three, four, five fucking years, bro. They got content for fucking days. Blue Archive, I think they're still Blue Archive is fine. They're still doing fuck, they're still doing their story. They're still making dough. People still love the fucking game. It's been what is it, 2020? It's been three years. They're good. Shit. <laughs> they're they're still three years. They're still good. They're still going on. FGO, that shit is never going EOS no time soon, bro. People, it, the, and that's because it's the fucking fate. It's, it's literally because of fate. Nikkei, we're in year, we're pretty much half of year two. They're not EOSing no time soon. People love fucking Nikkei. Brown Dust 2 just got their first anniversary. I think they're going to be chilling. And as more shit goes on, as the more marketing they do, they're going to be chilling. As long as they're making good dough, they're fine. Weathering Waves. I don't know why the fuck people thought that game was going to be dead on arrival, but um, it's going strong, and it, there are speculations that the game is made around $140 million fucking dollars. So, yeah. Like, yeah. So, EOS, for, so EOS for a lot of these games, especially the good, especially the good ones that are, have, that are going strong with their communities, you won't see them until like later down the fucking line in the years you won't you really fucking won't especially the ones that just came out but when it comes but like i said when it comes to a casino once you throw your money in and you lose you lose like what else are you supposed to do i'm telling y'all right now if you're old enough to go into the fucking game if you're old enough to go to the casino and you drop in 10 bucks you don't get that 10 bucks back unless you win. If you lose those 10 bucks, that 10 bucks is gone, bro. You got to make that shit back. 
It's fucking gone. So that's there's that's the difference between EOS and the guy and casino. One, you instantly fucking lose. Two, the other one, you're eventually gonna lose it. But you just don't know when. And it all depends on how strong the community and the game is going on when it comes to revenue. In this scenario, I am guaranteed to get at least one copy of Chloride. Meaning, I can't get enticed by my impulsive behavior to spend money because it will never reach that point. For the record, if a gacha game does not have a pity system, and believe me, there still are these days, then the section where I review monetization will instantly get a failing grade. I generally judge the game by the generosity of the gacha currency given and the rates that a player can realistically obtain new items as a casual. Another subtle practice is the use of a free daily pack found in the cash shop. Whenever you log in every day, there will be a red notification button next to the shop which you can go in and claim your daily free goodies. Now, the idea for this one is that when you're in an environment where you're expected to buy things, you're more likely to spend money. Of course, in a virtual environment, this can be a bit different, but the idea is the same. Path to Nowhere actually does something pretty sneaky here, where they put the free pack on the right side of the cash shop, so you have to scroll through all the paid stuff in order to see it. Not only that, one can easily defend this by saying, well, at least it's better than nothing. You're still getting a bit of free extra goodies every day, so you should still be grateful for it. You see? We're defending predatory practices one step at a time. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me, hear, let me hear that fucking shit again. Hold on. Full for it. You see, we're defending predatory police every defenders by saying, well, at least it's better stuff in order to see it. Not only that, one can easily defend this by saying, well, at least it's better than nothing. You're still getting a bit of free extra goodies every day, so you should still be grateful for it. You see, we're defending predatory practices one step at a time. Now, here's something dangerous that some live service games might try on you. Remember System 1 and 2? Well, let's go back to that college application example. If you were offered to be accepted into two different colleges, you will likely have to research the backgrounds and suitability of your choice, since it is a pretty big choice in one's life. But let's change the scenario a little bit. What if you are given two offers, same as before, but both colleges send you an urgent email? If you don't accept the offer in five minutes, then both offers will be rescinded. Uh oh, now we're running into a problem. You need to decide now. You can't rely on searching things up or really thinking about your choice. In this scenario, you're forced to use the System 1 method of thinking. When this decision really should have required System 2, you have to go by your gut instinct. Let's relate this into a game. If a gacha game gives you a flash sale deal, where you can spend quite a lot of money for some in-game resources, but you don't actually know how valuable those resources are or if they're worth the money at all. But, uh-oh, it's actually a limited time offer, and it's going away in just two minutes. Well, now you have to make an impulsive and instinctive decision to buy it or not buy it. When we're under stress, we often don't have the luxury to think things through. And this is exactly what is being exploited. Now, this technique is... I do see... I understand. Nikkei does this. Nikkei does this too. You know how you know how when it comes to um, the little flash sales pop up <coughs> after like the tribe tower and stuff like that, and they'll be like, "Oh, here, if you buy any of these packs, you can summon even more, or if you buy this shit, you can do more." And it's going away in like nine minutes. It goes away in ten minutes. I've seen that shit before. You see it pretty much everywhere. I'd say the main way of this getting um tackled is having a, some kind of timer on them, not being like five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour. I mean like the whole fucking patch. So 12 days, 15 days, 20 days, depending on how long the patch is, because you'll have those kind of packages. I say those are those kind of deals are legit fine because it gives people time to legit think if they want to buy this pack or not. Like for instance, for instance, uh, with Brown Dust 2 with the anniversary pack. The anniversary packages are lasting until the end of the anniversary. So I legit have time to think, do I want to get this now or do I want to wait and just get it later to see if my luck is good? You see what I mean? It's the same way... Uh, oh, no, no, no. It's not the same with Firefly. Well, actually, no, no, no. I can say that with Firefly. Actually, no, 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 no. Because it's a permanent. It's permanent. I was about to say, like, I can say the same thing with Firefly, the shop resets, 
but it's not the same thing. It's not packages. But with Rondas 2 specifically, they have an anniversary pack. It lasts until the anniversary is over. So I get it gives me time to think, do I want to get this? Or do I want to just scrum up and just get the money, not the money, and get the gems, get lucky, pull this character, bam, I'm all good, so I can save up for the rest. And if I still want to buy this pack later on, I can just buy this pack, save those tickets, save those gems for the next characters. It's nothing new in gaming, but used quite often by pushy salesmen, nudging you to sign a contract. I don't see this tactic being used very often in gacha games, but this is something I want to bring up. The next stuff is FOMO. You've likely heard of this term before, it stands for fear of missing out. Limited time events, cosmetics, characters, you name it. If you don't snag them now, they might not come back for a long time, if ever even. Ideally, when I judge these games, a player should not feel left out or behind progression if they join late or are thinking of taking a break. This is the reason I have a FOMO section in my reviews. I cannot in good faith support practices of having experiences or rewards locked behind time-limited events that don't come back, especially if that event contains important lore implications or very desirable items. This mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh my god, bro. They do Genshin to to be honest. Let's let's just be real. For the people who play Genshin, this is this is bad. Like they do have this. Like this they the way they do their um archiving with events is not good. Definitely not good. Especially when it comes to certain story events. The Arca the Golden Archipelago quest, Dragon Spine. Those two quests were so fucking good. But the thing is, you can't do them anymore. They weren't permanent events. Those were actual lore story events in the game. And you can't do those anymore. The Golden Archipelago event showed off Scarmouche. I didn't even know who the fuck Scarmouche was. I didn't even know who he was. Because I didn't, I believe at that point, I forget, I just didn't play that event. I was just still grinding shit. I did not play that event. And I legit did not, I was like, who the fuck is Scarabouche? And then I had to look it up. It was like, oh, it's an event that I just did not do. And I was like, all right, maybe it might come back later. Maybe it might be a way to actually do this. Maybe it's my archive. Uh, let's see, months later, still, still wasn't available. So I'm just sitting here like, damn, so this was important lore and story in this game that I cannot fucking do. Because it was time limited. Is one of my biggest gripes with a lot of these games. It is very predatory in nature, and I really hope this isn't common practice when people see the success of Genshin when they do this. The effects of FOMO elements should be apparent. They force you to monitor the game constantly to ensure no rewards or events are missed. You might not necessarily enjoy playing the game, but rather it will make you feel pretty bad if you missed out on something important. It's completely to the game's discretion if they want to rerun any past events. Yep. And this is where I'm going to say about what comes to events and FOMO. It's all up to the developers in the end on how they want to do these archive events, especially BA and NK. Because BA and NK, they archive at almost every single event, and, and they're still doing it to this day. Blue Archive, I believe they're going to continue archiving some events because there are some events that I haven't seen yet that are permanent. Nikkei continuously does this. I mean, the next archive event is going to be with Naga and Tia. They put Red Ash already done for the anniversary. They put fucking um, Overzone already. So they're good. They know how to do it. BD as well. B, but fuck, BD2 does it well. Um, Fuck. Except who, who in BD2? Okay. Oh, they just archive. Oh, yeah. And they archive the bunny event. I forgot about that. About that part. But yeah, it's all up to the game developers on how they do these events. Some do it well, and some not so well. Now, something I want to bring up is that despite all these measures, getting someone to start an additional live service game is actually a very hard sell. 
your time is limited. Everyone likely has existing responsibilities, such as school or work. Currently, you might play one or more gacha games. But how would you feel about adding one more to the pile? This year alone, we had Withering Waves launch, Triple Z, and Azure Promelia coming later. The question is, are you going to start playing any of these games? Yeah, uh -huh. yup. Now it's time for the time sunk fall- the sunk cost fallacy. Ah, uh, ha ha, buddy. Here it is. This is a major question for everybody. It's like, we all have lives to do. We all, we legit all have other things to do instead of playing our gotchas. And that's why I say for one thing, time efficiency, time efficiency when it comes to these gotchas is a big thing for me. It is a whole big thing for me. If I can be able to do my dailies in five, five to 10 minutes tops in my gotcha games and use all my energy and do like, like little bits of extra stuff. Like I don't have to do them all the time, but all the other extra stuff I can do like later on, then I'm good. That's why I like playing Brown Dust 2 and I like playing um, Blue Archive. It's because of the sweeping feature. The sweeping feature when it comes to BA is the best time saver I can ever ask for. And that's why I'm sticking with it because it saves me so much time. Brown Dust 2. Bro, that shit is so fast. <laughs> Brown Dust 2, I don't even need to do much. You clear the stage once, you have the sweeping mechanic open. It's it's done. It's literally fucking done. And the dailies aren't even that hard. Killing some enemies, leveling up a character, summoning, doing a newbie summon. It's that fucking easy, bro. When you have mechanics in the game that saves you time, that's the shit that I love when it comes to gacha games. That's what I like. So that's why I'm able to play Brown Dust 2 and Blue Archive. Because they're so easy for themselves. They are literally so easy to sweep. And they're such a time, they're literally time savers. They're so bad, they're such a fucking good time saver. The only one that I would say is takes a little bit more time is Weathering Waves is because, well, it's open world, but once but once I'm at a point in the game where I just need to like grind a little bit and I'm just ready, I don't have to log in for a little bit. Like for instance, once I get more, once I get more of my echoes and get uh, more essential materials for Jinshi, I'm gonna like give the game. I could like not play the game for like two days, and that it just feels great. But these other gotcha games, like, do I really want to add one fucking more? And that's the question I'm gonna have to answer when the time comes. When it comes to Zenla Zone Zero, I'm only gonna do that one stream, just play it, and that's really it. I'm not gonna like sink my time into it, even if it seems pretty cool to be like, man, this would be nice to just sink my time into this. Nah. I just do not have the time for a whole bunch of fucking games. I just don't. I have other things that I want to do. I have other, I literally have other projects that I'm doing in the works. Other hobbies that I like doing. And I just can't be playing all these fucking gacha games. It's just not worth it. Arknights Enfield. Depends. Enfield is a big, big old depend. Because there's also other games outside of gachas that I want to play. I have my consoles for a reason. I have my games for the yeah fuck yeah I have these consoles for a reason I have these other games I want to play so I'm not gonna be playing these gotchas all the damn time I want to take my time into these games that are gonna be very enjoyable that's not always a gotcha so that's another thing as a Promelia I'm gonna try it out for that I'm gonna at least try it out it's gonna be the same way as Zelda Zone Zero but I don't know if I see myself covering the game like frequently I know Zeoxis is gonna cover that game a lot is gonna try to cover that game a lot but I don't see myself doing it Arcades and Field Depends, depends. But I'm really keeping my gotchas at a good old three. And the only reason why I can keep it at a three, because two of them are so easy to play. And they're just so fast when it comes to the time. And one, it just takes a little bit of time to do. But when the update happens, it happens, it happens. I'm all good. So that, that's it. That's and me. And are you even going to give them a shot? If you have no plans to start a new one or even try it, what's stopping you? And how will any of them market itself so that you would at least give them a try? And conversely, how badly would any of the games you're currently playing mess up to make you not want to play it anymore? 
In the post-information age where live service games have reached full saturation, every shiny new title around the block is vying for your attention. Players today have a lot of choices of what games they want to engage with. The major difference between your traditional live service games and gacha games is that gacha games are considered way more casual and does not require a large time sink versus something like Call of Duty. It's not unusual for one to advertise itself as a side game, one you can manage on your daily commute or morning routine and be done with in like 5 minutes. The traditional gacha game today have very short daily mission routines. It's way less stressful to manage if you add 5 minutes to your daily schedule. But even with such low maintenance, when you have to juggle and micromanage so many games, you'll have to make a choice. Which ones to continue and which uh, ones to up? drop. Due to a lot of these subtle practices with retention and monetization, the choice can be quite difficult. A subtle way to induce FOMO is through the 30-day supply system, which is now present in a lot of gacha games. From a cost-efficient perspective, it makes perfect sense for low spenders to gain a lot of value with very little fees. But there's just one problem. As you may have guessed, if you don't log in for a day, this can make you lose out on those precious rewards. The same for battle pass systems too. <coughs> this idea ties to something called the sunk cost fallacy, and the natural human tendency to avoid losses, aka loss aversion. I mean, you've already committed so much time and money into something, it will be a shame to stop. This is a very strong motivator to retain players, but I do have a way to combat this. The sunk cost fallacy is exactly that, a fallacy. The main misconception here is that it doesn't matter what you do, you're not getting back the money you spent. For a real life example, it's like if you bought a ticket to a concert, but right before the event, your friends invite you to go clubbing. You know that going clubbing with friends will be fun, but since you had already spent money on the concert ticket, you're more inclined to try that out instead even if you may not enjoy it as much. After all, it will be a shame not to go. But this is just it. No matter what choice you pick here, the money spent on the ticket is gone. The rational choice here will be to go clubbing instead, since you know that your time will be better spent. Unlike money that one can always make back, your time is invaluable. In most live service games, there is a starter pack that lets you spend a small amount of money for a big boost. This can be as little as $1 and is typically considered as your entry ticket, since once you justify spending even that minuscule amount, you are now invested in sunk cost, and it's way easier for you to justify spending a bit more. Even if at the present time, you don't enjoy the game too much, but since you know that you have invested money into it, you're more inclined to play it further. Yup. After all, we that's exactly how That's exactly how I feel when it comes to Blue Archive and Weathering Waves. Not due to the fact that once I like once I put money into it, like I have to stick with it forever. But oh shit. Oh my god. But it's the fact that I'm enjoying the fucking game. Like I thoroughly enjoy playing the game. So that's the reason why I stay. And if the game is getting better, like the devs are improving on it, giving out the quality updates and all that. Then I'm inclined to stay for myself. I'm staying for a project. I only stay for a game if it gets better, and it still suffices what I like to see. Now, uh, granted, there might be some hit or misses, but hey, not everything is gonna be fucking perfect. Ram Rainbow sunshine's happiness and all that, and peaches and rainbows. But as long as they're giving out the good shit, and it's the shit that people like, hey, I'll stay. And if they're listening, and if the big part is the devs, if the devs are listening too, that's another big thing. If I like the devs are listening and they're providing what the fans want, hey, good looking out. And that's why I feel like with Brown Dust 2, as soon as I spend that little bit of money for a pack on Brown Dust 2, I'm pretty much in it for the long run. I am in it for the fucking long run when it comes to that game. Whether it waves, I'm in it for the long run. Blue Archive, I'm in it for the long run. Like, <laughs> Like I'm just I'm just in I'm in it I'm locked in that's what I'm playing that's what I like to enjoy that's what I do that's what I fucking do and will it be the same for these other gacha games in the future probably not <laughs> probably fucking not that's why I'm not gonna spend in, I'm not spending Godzilla Zone Zero as a Promelia there's no reason for me to and then uh fucking Ark Knights Enfield it all depends it literally all depends on Enfield Enfield is just a is literally the most is on the shakiest grind right now because I said I'm just gonna wait for Enfield for more Enfield news. Like legit going to wait for Enfield. So 
when there's when Enfield gets the news and stuff, that's when I'll cover it. That's when I'll talk about it. But for right now, I'll do Arc Knights whenever I want to. You will be ashamed to stop. Have you ever logged into a game you play every morning, day your dailies, and wondered, wait a minute, why am I doing this? What would happen if I just didn't log in for the day? When these retention systems. That's why I ask myself every time. I was like, every time, every time I like hop on fucking Blue Archive, I'm like, why am I doing this shit, bro? Like, there's no reason for me to play this shit. I'm only doing, like, I'm legit only doing this shit because, well, not the only reason, is because, well, I'm interested in the fucking game and I'm also just doing this because I make content. And that's another reason are in place it can almost make it feel like it has become part of your it's like how do i get out this bullshit this is habit building and it is designed that way by nature here's my challenge to you for tomorrow just don't log in to any of the gacha games you play easy right well maybe at first but try to think to yourself what would you miss out if you didn't log in and how bad would you feel about it if you've been playing a game for long it can be increasingly hard to quit because you're in so deep here's the thing this would be hard for me because weathering, like, for instance, for instance, since I am still low leveled in Blue Archive and Brown Dust 2, I have to log in so I can get stronger. I'm not strong. I'm not sitting comfortably to where I can just take a break from the game and don't have to miss out on resources and all that. No, 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 no. I have to get stronger because right now I'm not at a point. I'm not at a comfortable point where I could just put the game down. And it's with Weather it Waves, they're literally doing a double tactic discord reward. So <laughs> that's already hard enough for me to do. Like I'm going to miss out on a whole bunch of echo drops if I do, if I don't log in. It's stuff, it's events like these that will keep you in. In terms of time and money invested, it would be such a waste to stop now. But let me suggest something that may change your perspective on this. Imagine the total amount of money you spent on a game as the total cost of a ticket used to go see a live show. Maybe you spend nothing. Maybe you spend a couple hundred, two hundred, a thousand, and maybe even more. On the other hand, the total amount of time you spend playing the game is the duration of the live show itself. The show may have gone on for a week, a month, a year, maybe even more. It may have been a very expensive ticket, and it may have been a long show. But even the best of shows must come to an end. You got your money and time's worth. Now that the show is over, it's time to go home. You're leaving the theater feeling satisfied and content that you've seen such a good performance. This is how I could imagine how letting go of a game could look like. You never wasted any money or time. It was all worth it at the end, and you're ready to move on. There's a reason I say, thank you for watching, and as always, have fun with the game. As always, have fun with the game. Thank you for watching as always, and remember, have fun out there. I think with the growing nature of live service games, we often no longer play them because it's fun, but because we would feel left out if we didn't. With all these predatory practices, I think often we forget why we play games in the first place, and it's to have fun. It's as simple as that, which means if you're not having fun with a game and are playing for FOMO, sunk costs, or just gambling tendencies, just stop playing. I am demanding you to stop playing games that you don't find fun. Holy shit, bro. I'm so glad somebody else is finally saying the same shit that I've said plenty of fucking times. Also, chat. Pause whatever the fuck y'all are talking about, and let's get on to this bullshit right... Well, not bullshit. Let's get on to this shit right here. I'm gonna rewind it. I'm gonna replay it for y'all just so y'all can hear what the fuck he's talk what he just said. And it's to have fun. It's as simple as that. Which means if you're not having fun with a game, and are playing for FOMO, sunk costs, or just gambling tendencies, just stop playing. I am demanding you to stop playing games that you don't find fun. Hopefully... We like, yeah, if you are not having fun with a got with the gotcha media or a gotcha game or just any game in general, and you constantly complain and complain and complain and say all this shit, then why the fuck are you continuing to play the fucking game if you don't enjoy it?
if you're only playing the game like he said like he said if you're only playing the game for fomo if you're only playing the game for all of this shit bro if you're only playing the game because you might be missing out on shit but you don't enjoy the core gameplay at all or just the game itself then why the fuck are you still playing you are suffering through it yourself you're pushing through bullshit that you don't need to push through just leave up just go move on to the next game if you're not having fun there's no reason for it i've already left these games i'll come back i'll just look into it that's why i left genshin my reasons of leaving genshin i just don't find the combat fun anymore that's just me i just don't find the combat fun anymore it just felt boring i went to weather i dropped the game entirely I went to Weather Waves. I found the combat fun. I enjoy building these characters and getting these echoes. And that's why I'm playing. It's all in the fun factor. Blue Archive. I'm enjoying the. I'm enjoying now getting into raids and shit. Trying to figure. Getting pissed off. At, well, not really getting pissed off at these raids, but I enjoy playing these raids and stuff. I enjoy the fuck out of the story. I'm going to be doing the events. I'm going to be doing the events eventually. Uh, next month, probably. Probably next month. The anniversary is there too. I'm enjoying the game. I'm having fun. Brown does too. I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying somebody get that game. I'm enjoying the combat. The combat's really interesting to be because it's turn based. The turn based combat's interesting. I'm into it. There's a reason why. There's reasons why I just pretty much don't play DK as much anymore. I'll talk about it. That doesn't. That doesn't mean I won't talk about it just because I don't play the game anymore. I still want to check out on the game that I put the time and it used to play. And see how where it's going. I'll still talk about it from time to time when there's stuff to talk about. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna continuously play it every day. Same thing with HSR. I gave my break on HSR a few times, and well, I just don't play it like that anymore. I played it so much, even though throughout the first anniversary and shit and shit like that, I got bored. I only come back when there's actual con when there's actual content I want to play. That's the only time I'll come back and try it out. And after that. I give the break, give the game it's like months break, and that's pretty much it. I already tried the Shadow Abyss, the new mode, and I left. You saw it last night. You literally saw me play that shit last night. I tried it, bam, I did what I wanted to do, and then I left. As simple as that. There's just no reason to play games for FOMO that you're not enjoying. There's just not. I've already quit a lot of games. Like, my game pool right now, like, when it comes to ga my game pool, my game pool is very fucking small. I don't play most of the games I have constantly. I play fighting games with my friends. That's pretty much it. I play my single player games when I want to. When they're done, they're done. With the lessons here today. But, if you're seeing, but especially these live service games, especially on the top of live service games, if there is a reason why you're playing this game, it has to be because it's fun. There's no reason to play the game if you're not having fun. I was able to better prepare you for any future games you might pick up and playing them more cautiously to not fall into any of these traps. After all, gacha games can be fun, but just never lose sight of why you play them. Thank you for watching, and as always, have fun out there. Good video. I think this good video. He did cover a lot of points. He did cover a lot of points. The psychological side of the gotchas. Pretty good video. Pretty, pretty fucking good video. He covered a lot of the good points. This is going to be a long ass video to post. <laughs> but go subscribe to Psyche. He made, he, he killed it. He definitely killed it.